Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, so I'm Sanjeevan, and uh, thank you everyone for joining with us in this afternoon. Uh, so yeah, I work at Voltron Data in Open Source Engineering Department, and uh, so my work mostly revolves around contributing to open source projects like Apache Arrow, uh, the Substrate project, and recently the Velox project by Facebook. Uh, so I'm sure when you like heard about the title of the talk, uh, you guys have must have guessed that uh, there's something related to data architectures, data platforms, data engines, something like that. And when I was just preparing about this talk and thinking about how can I start with this, I saw a very uh, interesting post by a folks from Tabula, who are the people behind the Apache Iceberg project, and this was this. So, and I kind of not disagree to this. I mean, it's true, data platforms have been growing in a tremendous, in a exponential rate. With every uh, 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 selfies you click for Instagram, with every, your uh, smart watches, everything in which you de generate data and you generate queries, we need new data platforms which can scale up to that level and work on that queries. And statistics shows us as, uh, shows us as that well. So with the growing rate of data generation and data queries, it's just going to be massive in how uh, we need uh, composable data systems and unified data architectures for having a more efficient and more linear approach and uh, f for efficient use of the data. But, so with this, as I said, uh, right now uh, we have different kind of data workloads uh, in, in the market. Like we have analytical data, we have transactional data, we have real-time data, machine learning, graph, it's just, just too much like with everything and in the data processing world that we have. And because of this, we need different architectures for different workloads because of the specific needs that you want to have in, in those workloads. I mean, obviously, you can't just use uh, SQL engine for running your PyTorch queries, right? Because that won't work, because we need specific use cases for that. So yeah, for, say for analytics engine, we have uh, Presto or Apache Spark. But for transactional, we can use MySQL or RocksDB. But for machine learning, we have to use PyTorch. Now, well, this is good. Uh, this gives us a way to have different specific engines for the specific use cases. But it also provide, makes, gives us a different challenge. And the challenge is, because of uh, very specific use case that they support, they have limited reusability. You can't use one data architecture for a different case use case. They have inconsistency. Say, if you have one data architecture running for analytical data, and you have to fuse it with a different data source for, say, real-time data, you can't just use both of them together without having to configure a lot of stuff uh, before doing that. And But if we just take a step back, if we just take a step back, and if we see what these data architectures basically comprise of, like what they are made of, what's the blueprint, they are mostly made up of these five layers. There is a language front end at the top, an intermediate representation after that, an optimizer, execution engine, and an execution runtime. The language front end is basically like, like how, you, how you pass SQL query in, in, a, uh, in, a, like in a database. And the front end's work is to, provide, is to take the SQL queries and to convert into its own intermediate representation for its own understanding. But the optimizer checks if we can optimize it much, uh, better, much further. And then it goes to the execution engine, which prepares it for uh, calling it in the execution runtime. Well, this is all fine, but this, but this, the same architecture goes on for all kind of data workloads, as I say, as I said, be it analytical, be it uh, Spark, be it Kubrick, in any kind of data architectures, it's mostly the same same blueprint that goes into into the picture. So, what can we do? Because we need somehow to unify this process. We can't just have where this, all those different architectures for all, the, for all the use cases. I mean, the data engineers will just go mad if you have to create all those data, data architectures for all the use cases, right? So we can't do anything for the language front end. I mean, you can't use a different uh, language front end for a different workload. That's the purpose of that they are playing. We can't do anything with the intermediate presentation as well. The optimizer, mm, that, can be op that can be used in a unified process for some, uh, for some steps, but it can't just do all the job. But we can do one thing. We can make some change in this layer. That is the engine. That is the engine whose work is to just take the data, just take the steps, what we want to do with the data, and just execute it. That's it. Like It has provided the data. It has provided the exact uh, computation steps that needs to be called. And its job is to just do it. So that's where the Velox engine by Meta actually works. Velox's uh, vision is to have a unified way of which can be integrated in a different in variety of data architectures and it can work even have a even if the data workload is different even if the architecture as a whole is different 
So uh, Pedro, uh, who is one of the core developers of Velox, uh, he, st he says the vision of Velox is to converge, accelerate, and unify data execution engine. Because uh, a unified and composable data system may be the requirement for the present, but it's a necessity for the future, concerning how in the scale in which the data platforms have been growing right now. Now, if we just give an overview of Velox, so it started as a Facebook's internal project. It was called Folly for Data, F4D. Uh, in its own like textbook definition, it's called as a generic C++ database acceleration library, which basically such means that uh, it can be used to like accelerate the database queries when you have. Uh, uh, but in actually, it's a it's basically a unified execution engine. It's uh, natively it's written in C++ uh, for maximum efficiency. And yeah, it's vectorized. It's, it was vectorized from scratch. Uh, all the operations that you can perform in Velox, it's, it's completely in vectorized format. The first steps to open source was in late 2021. And by 2022, it was a part of the Facebook incubator project. And now it has uh, partners from academia and industry, uh, like Ahana, Intel, and Voltron Data, who are contributing a lot to the Velox project and uh, making it much more easier for the community to uh, uh, use it further. Now, if you just see the components that Velox has, so firstly, it defines the types, that is, uh, in which format the data actually present, uh, is actually present in the engine, and, and it's actually uh, uh, flows through the engine. Secondly, the vectors. So vectors are, are the fundamental blocks of Velox. Uh, vectors are basically arrow, columnar, form, columnar data. Uh, it's arrow compatible, so it's mostly, made, uh, mostly uh, based out of Apache Arrow itself. But yeah, so that's ve vectors basically defines how data resides in the Apache, in the Velox engine. Thirdly are the expressions. That's like the actual thing that Velox uh, does. That is the vectorized expression evaluation engine. So we'll come to it later in the slides. Uh, fourthly, the functions of the operator. So Velox supports functions uh, like uh, mathematical functions and also uh, uh, string functions, concatenation, uh, anything like that. And also operators like SQL operators like unnest, join, filter, project. It also supports I.O. So uh, in usual cases, Velox takes the data from memory, but we can also use connectors to connect it with, say, Hive-based databases or S3. And then we can pull the data and do the computations in the Velox. And it also provides network serializers to uh, pass through the din, uh, network and provide data and or pull from the data, pull from the data source. And it also has its own resource management. Uh, it can uh, use its own memory pools, caching, uh, threads, and all. Now, if we go through the Velox components, the first thing that I said, the uh, fundamental unit of Velox is vectors. So vectors is basically a column-oriented uh, memory uh, format. Uh, it is similar to Arrow, but also has its own uh, differences than Arrow. Uh, like it supports encodings like flat dictionary constant. Uh, previously, Arrow was not uh, Arrow didn't have support for string view. That is, it didn't have a custom fixed width string encoding. But Arrow recently had uh, that support uh, included. And we, uh, as a company, we're also working on uh, making Velox and Arrow much more uh, aligned, so as to have a so as to use Velox for co computing on Arrow uh, arrays as well. Now, it's, uh, Velox also supports modified encoding for complex types like arrays, maps, and support structs. The major advantage of Velox is that it supports out of order writes. So it doesn't matter even if your data is not in the proper order in which it should be. Uh, Velox has its compatibility to make it uh, to still run even in the uh, uh, data is not in order. And it also supports lazy vectors. So it's much very beneficial in case of joins or conditionals in projection, where it only populates the data when it's called, actually. Now, if you just see the uh, flat encoding in, vector, in the Velox vectors, so it's basically to understand how data resides in, in Velox. So like we have a uh, nulls buffer, and we have a values buffer over here. So the nulls buffer basically says in which position the, uh, the values buffer is actually a null, so as to, not, so as to skip that and to uh, make the computation much more efficient. And the values buffer basically stores it. So even if we have vectors in the front end, it's just an abstraction. We need somehow to, uh, rep we need uh, actual data buffers to represent the uh, data formats in internally. And vectors and buffers, they own their own memory, and they can share it and reuse it safely. Uh, 
Uh, vectors also support dictionary encoding, so if there is a lot of uh, data repetitions, it can just use uh, dictionaries to, uh, where there is an indices buffer and uh, as uh, in addition to the values buffer. The indices buffer basically says in which uh, location the values are repeated, so as to have, so as to fetch those values from the values buffer. And yeah, uh, they are much, they are very useful in case of their, uh, in the case where there are a lot of repeated values and they also provide just zero copy representation of uh, like cardinality reducing or increasing operations. Now the question is then why do we need well, pi velox? Because we had velox, that's a C++ engine that works, that's just fine. But the, why the need for pi velox just came up? Now the first question, the first reason is that we need to support not only platforms but also products. Like right now, uh, Velox only supported platforms. Like it's a library, you can just include it in your own data architecture and then you can just call its own functions. But if you have in, it in, in, in a Python interface, it will be much simpler to use it as, a, as an entire product. Like you can have your PyTorch uh, using Velox in, internally to call its own inference functions. Secondly, the need was failed to have a front end which, which should allow uh, users for easy experimentation and exploring the Velox APIs without uh, having the hassle to actually build the entire C++ project and then test it out. But why Python as a first language? Uh, obviously, well, because of its wide global adoption. Secondly, it's widely used for machine learning. So Facebook's one, uh, uh, one uh, vision for PyTorch in the future is to use uh, Apache arrows, Apache arrow arrays uh, in, in, in their tensors. So there's a new project called Torch Arrow uh, in which they're trying to use arrows, uh, uh, Apache arrow instead uh, for their Torch tensors implementation. And there you, they, used to, they, wanted to, they want to use the Velox uh, engine for uh, doing all the inference computations. Uh, thirdly, it has a great library support, and yeah, so PyVelox becomes a toolkit for the Velox de library developers as well to easily experiment their new functions or their new support. And uh, as I said, the Torch Arrow, which uh, right now uses only a limited subset of the C++ Velox APIs, with the PyVelox interface coming up, it will be very easy to actually uh, just uh, include the PyVelox uh, uh, libraries and then use it within the Torch Arrow implementation. Now, for that reason, uh, Voltron Data collaborate with the Meta Open Source team for, for the PyVelox development. And the audience that we are currently focusing are the Velox developers, of course, uh, the extension developers, the people who are new to the Velox engine, and also the third-party integrations. So Velox, uh, so any kind of uh, C++ or any any engine that is written in C++ or say Rust, we need an interface to bind it with with Python. And Velox uses PyBind 11, one of the most sophisticated, brilliant, and efficient uh, interface. It's very easy to use, very easy to implement. You don't need to figure out how the interpreter logs works in Python. You just need to call up, uh, include a library, and PyBind 11 uh, takes care of all the stuff. So yeah, Velox, uh, PyVelox uses PyBand 11 for all its uh, interfacing with, uh, uh, with the actual C++ engine. It's currently in alpha state. Uh, it was first released in uh, PyPy in uh, March 2023. So yeah, we are, we are uh, calling a lot of community support for its, uh, for its further implementation. Uh, so yeah, you can just Im call, import the PyVelox library as such and you can just uh, use it, the engine. Now, to instantiate a vector, like the fundamental block of PyVelox, uh, so when I say vector, it's basically a column of data. So it's like, a, like if you have a table, the column that you, that you have in the table, it's basically how the vector supports that. So you can uh, instantiate a list, uh, instantiate a vector from the list. You, can, you just need to pass the list into, the, uh, into this method, and yeah, you get a Velox vector. So this method, it's, it looks very simple, but it, it, a, lot, like a lot of uh, uh, operations are actually going behind this function, behind this method. You can call it using a constant vector, where you can just give the values and number of times it's getting repeated, and you will get the vector itself. Uh, we can also have a dictionary vector, again, the values and uh, the indices. And lastly, we can also specify, uh, like uh, give an explicit data type in which we need the, uh, the Velox vector. Uh, the data types that are currently supported are all the physical data types uh, like Boolean integer, big integer. And for the complex data types, we currently support the row data type and the array and map is still under development. We have active PRs for that as well. Now, just to give a little hint on what are the complex data types actually mean. So say we have an array vector. So if I say an integer vector, it basically means that you have a column in your table which of, of data type integer. But if you want to have a 
like a column in a table with list values that where uh, array vector actually comes up. So it's a collection of list of elements of similar type. Similarly, map vectors are a collection of list of key value pairs, and whereas a row vector is actually a collection of list of rows. So basically, row vectors can be used to actually encompass and a complete uh, table in uh, or a data frame or or, a, or even a single column, but if it is made up of structs. Now the most important part of the Velox engine is the expression evaluation. Like how can we actually uh, call up a method or call up a function within Velox and how you can actually uh, see the computation that works up. So it can run on simple expressions. As simply you just need to pass the expression as a string. You just need to pass the data and that's it. Uh, it does all, PyVelox does all the job internally from there. Uh, we can also have functions like concatenation and yeah, again you need to pass the data and yeah, that's it. Uh, PyVelox does the job internally. And we can also work on complicated expressions, like even if you want to compute on uh, like the uh, roots of a quadratic equation, we need to specify the exact uh, string on how to do it, and yeah, that's it. Uh, PyVelox can do the work internally. So how the expression evaluation actually works is, first, when you pass the expression as a string, it gets compiled into an, its own expression tree. Like it has its, it first checks for sub-expressions. If there is a common sub-expression, which is getting repeated a lot of times, so it will first compute it br briefly. And then it will also try to flatten the ands and ors. It will flatten the concat-like functions, and it will do the constant folding, and it will also gather the expression metadata. From this uh, information, it builds the expression tree, and then the expression tree goes into the evaluation process, where like the sub-expressions are first evaluated uh, separately, and the computing of the distinct values are done. The diction if any dictionaries or any repetitive values are present, so they are computed separately, and uh, the then the nulls are handled. When all the steps are being done, all the actual expression is getting get, gets evaluated in the Velox engine. Uh, Velox also supports serialization and deserialization. So if you have a Velox vector, you can just save it in your secondary memory uh, using the save vector method. And say, uh, same with uh, loading the vector in your memory. So right now, it only uh, saves using the H5 algorithm, uh, like the H5 compression algorithm. But yeah, we are also focusing on trying different compression algorithms or different ways to save into your secondary memory. Uh, okay, yeah, Velox also supports converging, converting with arrow arrays, so arrow as becoming a new benchmark for day of columnar data formats. So we need a way to uh, like convert to and from arrow arrays. So uh, yeah, we can, if you have a list, we can just ex call this export to array method and uh, the vector gets automatically converted to an arrow compatible object. So a lot of like operations actually goes on in, in inside this, uh, like then have to check if the data types are compatible, if the memory pools are fine, if the, uh, if there is, is there any inconsistency that's, that goes. So after all a lot of checks and operations, it gets converted to an arrow array. And similarly, if you have a, a, a arrow array, you can just call the import from array method and then it gets converted to a Velox vector. Uh, we have a lot of signatures in PyVelox. Uh, so signatures are basically if you want a very specific function from a very specific data engine or a database to be uh, to run within the Velox engine, you can just register those functions and then you can call, say, suppose the functions in the Velox engine as well. So one important thing that is currently under development in the Velox architecture is its integration with Substrate. So those of you who don't know about Substrate, Substrate uh, is a new project. It's called a cross-language serialization for relational algebra. So it's uh, it's more like a new development over the SQL. So the question comes up that we had SQL as a way of uh, providing queries over a database. But the issue is with different dialects coming up for different kind of data architectures, we need a way to have a uniform, uh, to have a unified and a uniform way uh, to express uh, data relations. So uh, as Apache Arrow is becoming a universal standard for representing tabular data, a substrate is a, has a vision of uh, becoming a universal standard for representing relational operations over those data. So like Apache Arrow and substrate are two of the key blocks in developing a unify, uniform, unified, and composable data stacks. Now in the future developments, we plan to complete the support for plan builder, while Velox has, a, has its own plan builder where you can specify a, a complete uh, data execution plan uh, PyVelox does not support it yet. We also fi fi want to fi finalize the substrate integration and also have a parquet data reader, basically a data connector. And we also want to use uh, UDFs, user-defined functions. So Velox supports UDFs. You can just specify your own uh, functions uh, for, for execution, but you can't do it in uh, PyVelox right now. But yeah, we're working on it. 
and also five velox fuzzer so fuzzer is basically a tool that's integrated in velox for de for debugging uh, an execution process five velox does not support it yet but yeah it's also in the plan and right now and lastly documentation we need a lot of documentation in the entire project it still lacks good documentation for um, uh, for like become for like uh, having much more much better community support so yeah, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you for listening to the pro listening to the presentation. And if you have any questions, I will try to answer them. Okay, thank you.